Hi, if you've been following this series, this is the point at which our subject, David C. Pack, has run out of specific things that he doesn't know about science, and can now only gripe about vague things that he doesn't know about science. This series has been answering the question, does God exist? No, it hasn't. You've only assumed your answer, and it's incorrect. God is only a magic imaginary friend. He is not real. We have already examined many scientific facts, quotes, and stunning evidence from the natural world that proves a master creator designed all we see around us. But there is more to learn. You have a lot to learn because you don't know anything. You haven't examined anything and you pretty much just read from the library of fraudulent pseudoscience and have no idea what science even is. And you haven't presented any indication that a god could even exist. The argument from incredulity is a logical fallacy. It is not evidence. Part four looks more closely at how true science in no way disproves God. There is no need to disprove impossible absurdities that were never even indicated to begin with. We will also see how evolutionists get away with presenting their theories as established fact, along with the changing scenarios scientists use to explain how life came to be. Watch to the end. You've got evolution confused with abiogenesis and can't distinguish facts from theories or hypotheses. I'm being sincere and completely serious. You do not have even a middle school understanding of science. That's not an exaggeration. You really don't. Quoting is done more than other broadcasts because we now bring additional proof showing scientists in their own words explaining why the existence of a god is necessary. Why there being no God is entirely implausible, literally not possible. Anyone who has seen this series up to this point can guess that you still haven't shown that a God is possible. We already know that it's not possible and there is no science to indicate otherwise. The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, Editor-in-Chief of The Real Truth Magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age full of war, famine, pollution, disease, disasters, and economic uncertainty, and ever-worsening bad news, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. First, let's look more in depth at how evolutionists get away with presenting their theory as established fact. Right there, you show how little you know. Facts are points of data which are either not in dispute or are indisputable in that they are objectively verifiable. Natural laws are different from mere facts. A law is a general statement in science expressed either as a short phrase or a mathematics equation, which is always true under a given set of circumstances. Hypotheses are potentially falsifiable suppositions or explanations which can be tested and include predictions as to what different results should imply about it. A scientific theory is not at all what you think it is. A theory is a body of knowledge or field of study encompassing all these other things. So the many verifiable facts of evolution and the demonstrable laws of evolution Evolution, along with any remaining hypotheses, are all contained within the theory of evolution. Writers, lecturers, and television programs on evolution use a variety of deceptive tricks, wittingly or unwittingly, to sell their audience what is unproven and unprovable. No, you're talking about your religion, not evolution. While the rule is that no scientific theory can ever be proven in the positive sense, the theory of evolution has been proven in the practical sense. There are a great many facts of evolution, things we actually know to be true, at the, because we can show that they are true. And that is entirely different than the crazy shit you believe for no reason. Creation logic is mocked and replaced by bald illogic. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, uh, you said the words creation and logic as if they could ever go together. You gotta laugh at that. Theories are professed with no more than suggested proof, and sometimes not even this. You need to be specific, because I don't know what you're talking about, and neither do you. Proof, in the sense that you're talking about, is an overwhelming preponderance of evidence. Since theories cannot be proved, we'll have to translate your use of proof to evidence. Every scientific theory is a body of evidence. They're literally made of evidence, except for string theory, which is a mathematic theory, not a scientific theory. Otherwise, there is no theory that has only suggested evidence. 
Fascinating truths are woven toward whatever false conclusion is needed. No, you're talking about your religion again. Science isn't like that. Important history and figures are used to support mere conjecture. You mean like when you cited Albert Einstein and Werner von Braun to support your pure conjecture? Except, of course, that science is not about conjecture and doesn't allow it. But that's all religion is. Everything you believe is conjecture. You're also pretty dependent on projection. Notice how you're not really describing my position. You're really describing your own religious beliefs. Powerful music sometimes stirs emotions to glorious heights of association with supposed truth. Compelling language is used in scripting of outcome to sell nonsensical drivel. Poetic rhythm is often employed with utter gibberish repeated over and over until the viewer or reader has almost no choice but to collapse and accept pure fiction as fact. Foolish comparisons are sprinkled throughout. Marvelous visible wonders are connected to opinions. None of this applies to evolutionary science. Our truth is not supposed, it's verifiable. Truth is whatever can be shown to be true. What I say is truth, I can show to be true. What you say is truth, I can show to be false. Otherwise, it's only empty, indefensible assertions, at best, literally gibberish with poetic rhythm, all designed to make people believe what is really pure fiction, without any truth to it at all. Powerful graphics are shown, but also based on complete fiction, like bone fragments being presented as part of the evolutionary fossil record when no such record exists. You just said that the total number of fossils that have ever been discovered were never discovered, that they do not exist. So do you think that every fossil ever found have all been fraudulent? What about the tens of thousands of paleontologists working around the world today? Are they merely craftsmen making handmade forgeries? Would this include Georges Cuvier, the father of paleontology who lived in the 1700s? He was a Christian anatomist who identified the fossils brought to him by several different people from numerous quarries. So how could he have faked those? Does it matter if they're Christian? Because Dr. Robert T. Bacher may be an important paleontologist with two Ivy League science degrees, but he is also a Pentecostal preacher. What motive would he have for faking fossils? And how would he do that when he's on a dig with all of these other people? Does he go there the night before and bury everything, expecting them to find it? I guess what you're suggesting must be a massive, globally cohesive conspiracy spanning over 300 years without any leaks, regardless of the different religious convictions of anyone involved. That's amazing especially when you consider that it is all for absolutely no reason at all, except perhaps to disprove a collection of fables that have already been disproved. I've been to all the best natural history museums in Los Angeles, Houston, New York, London, and the Dallas Museum and the Perot Museum. And you're saying that all of those displays in all of those places are fake? When I recently toured the Royal Tyrell Museum in Alberta, the director gave me a private tour of their labs and fossil stores. They have some amazing stuff back there, most of which they're still trying to extract from the surrounding rock, but I guess you think they're just sculpting them, right? When I was a paleo student myself, my professor gave me this trilobite from the Paleozoic era. It's a, it was in a drawer full of similar fossils, most of which is still partially embedded in sedimentary rock, but I guess you think this is just handmade jewelry. What about this ammonite, or this one? If you can see them up close, you can tell that they're different species. These are both Cretaceous ammonites. They're quite a bit different than the orthocones that you get from the Paleozoic. I dug these out of the ground myself on a fossil dig as part of a class trip, and then, of course, I wrote a paper about it as was required. Do you expect me, or anyone, to believe that these fossils I'm holding in my hand, or these fossils, don't even exist? Because that forces me to ask a difficult question. Are you mentally incompetent, willfully ignorant, or deliberately dishonest? And I'm going with two out of three, because I see that you've amassed quite a cult under your control, a multi-million dollar racket. So you're obviously not willfully, you're obviously not mentally incompetent necessarily, maybe not completely, but you are willfully ignorant without excuse, and you've shown that you are deliberately dishonest as well. In other words, you are a liar. 
there is a fossil record and there's no way, even as ignorant as you are, that you don't know that. Facts are tied to confusing, mystical statements that breed acceptance. No, wrong. There are no mystical statements in science. Mysticism is only for the religious. Near impossible probabilities are just ignored. Imagine that police find a body with a knife in it with the fingerprints of a deranged madman who's covered in the victim's blood. What's the probability that that particular person should die on this particular night of all others? under these circumstances especially. But it doesn't matter how improbable you think it all is. That will never refute the evidence showing that it did happen. Uh, what you believe is extremely improbable and implausible and impossible. So shut up. Utterly impossible conclusions are presented for belief by simple assertion. No, that's you. Everything your belief system teaches is impossible and requires belief without any supportive evidence or logic whatsoever. What I believe is verifiable and all of it supported by evidence. Scientific terms are oft spoken and used to mean whatever evolutionists need them to. No, again, scientists are very clear in their definitions and they don't change their definitions like you do because we don't move the goalposts like you do. For example, I refined a number of terms in the most concise and precise definitions I could state relevant to this argument and posted them on my blog a few years ago, and they're still there. But I've seen your people use up to four different definitions for the same thing in the same paragraph because you don't want to understand what is really true. You just want to make believe whether it's true or not. Misleading anti-Bible statements are used such as matter obeyed commands we could discover laws the Bible hadn't mentioned. My favorite one is Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21, where the alleged word of God says that men are only animals and that to believe otherwise is only vanity. It is especially funny when God says that who knows if an animal even has a soul or not. They called it breath back then because the people, the superstitious primitives who wrote your compilation of fables, thought that air was a spirit. What did they know? They're just the people who invented your God. I've even seen cartoon characters speak incredibly shallow commentary to drive a completely false point. Well, you should have shown it then. I love those. Although, having seen your pattern till now, knowing how you misrepresent things, I could guess that the incredibly shallow commentary was probably a profound truth. Outright silliness is given and received as science merely because it is said with a straight face. And simple imagination is passed off as scientific certainty. No, not in any case. You're talking about yourself again, with your talking snakes and donkeys, tower to heaven, the sun stopping in the sky, and sticks turning into snakes and all that. You know you can't cite specifics because you know you're wrong. Sadly, Anti-creationists constantly denigrate any idea of creation by any means possible. By every means possible, but we don't need to. Because if I state something as fact, I can show that it is fact. But you can't. Whatever you say is limited to unsupported and irrational ravings and dependent on logical fallacies, falsehoods, and frauds. I don't have to denigrate your position. If you were held to the same standards as I am, you'd see that you do that to yourself. Terrible bias blinds them. No, that's you again. You're the one who has to defend your belief system even after it's been proven wrong. I'm not required to believe anything, but I do have to consider what the evidence indicates, and I can't ignore that regardless what I would rather believe. However sincere, scientists who were taught to reject the Creator's revealed instruction book present far-fetched theories about the beginning of all things. Instruction book? I wish this were a two-way conversation, because your book gives no instructions. It doesn't say anything that is verifiably true, gives no explanation for the history of the cosmos or how anything really works, and if you use it as a moral guide, you'd be a criminal in every country on this planet. The creators of your book knew less about the world than you do. Think about that, or ask someone smarter than you to think about it for you. A quote describes how all humans, animals, and plants supposedly sprang from nothing. No, it doesn't, because no, they didn't, and no one but creationists believe they did. 
If you compress all the time since the Big Bang, the explosive birth of the universe, into a single Earth year, a billion years is about one month of that year. What was happening on Earth a billion years ago? Most of Earth's land was amassed into a supercontinent called Rodinia. It was a barren desert. No animals, no plants, single-celled organisms dominated the oceans. This is pure opinion that is now broadly challenged. No, this is indicated by evidence, not opinion, and there is no evidence or challenge against it. But some existed in colonies called microbial mats, and the first multicellular organisms would soon evolve. Again, simple opinion, supposition presented with authority. If you think Carl Sagan spoke from authority, then you weren't paying attention. Because, he said, and this is my favorite quote from him, there are no sacred truths. All assumptions must be critically examined. Arguments from authority are worthless. Whatever is inconsistent with the facts, no matter how fond of it we are, must be discarded or revised. I can understand why you'd have a problem with that. This eloquent rationality is exactly opposite of your irrational defense of senseless delusion. This show concluded suggesting viewers not let ignorant, fanatical religionists confuse them. So you're trying to get to them first. I get it. But you really should have paid attention. You should have watched this show yourself, all 13 episodes, because there is far better philosophical perspective there than can be found in your sacred fables of slavery, cruelty, and barbaric superstition where there is not a hint of wisdom. We continue. Have scientists known sin? Of course. We have misused science, just as we have every other tool at our disposal. The leap of logic begins here, and that's why we can't afford to leave it in the hands of a powerful few, unless they're scientists. Duh. Science should be in the hands of scientists, just like shoemaking should be in the hands of cobblers. Trained pilots should be the ones flying the planes, and only doctors should practice medicine. There is no sense turning science over to someone like you who doesn't know what it is or how to do it. The more science belongs to all of us, the less likely it is to be misused, meaning by religionists. No, wrong again. There he was talking about totalitarians. You couldn't misuse science because you'd have to know how to use it first. It's a way of stripping away what isn't true to find out what is. That's a game you won't play. You've obviously never read any scientific articles or journals. You've had no education in the subject whatsoever. All you know about science is what you read in popular magazines at the doctor's office or one episode of a TV series that you probably didn't even watch. These values undermine the appeals of fanaticism and ignorance. And, after all, the universe is mostly dark, guided by islands of light. Learning the age of the Earth or the distance to the stars or how life evolves because it matters what's true and our imagination is nothing compared to nature's awesome reality. I want to know what lies beyond the cosmic horizon and how life began. But the great God tells us. No, there is no God and even if there was, it never said anything. You don't have the word of God. You have a jumbled compilation of myths appropriated from different religions which mystics have mistaken for the word of God. But even if that was the word of God, the Bible still doesn't tell you how anything happened. God said, let it be, is not an explanation. It's a story, a very silly fable where no part of it has even a kernel of truth. We've begun to learn the story of our origins, star stuff, contemplating the evolution of matter, but you have seen matter cannot evolve, that this is impossible. No, I showed you how it can, and I used one of your own references to do that. Tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness, we and the other living things on this planet carry a legacy of cosmic evolution spanning billions of years. If we come to know and love nature as it really is, then we will surely be remembered by our descendants as good, strong links in the chain of life. Obviously very sincere, but just as sincerely wrong. No, you asshole. Carl Sagan is one of the most venerated astrophysicists, cosmologists. He's literally a rocket scientist, a Pulitzer Prize winning science communicator, and a brilliant man. He also happens to be right because what he said is verifiably correct. 
while everything you said is bewilderingly inane. All you've done is compile lies upon lies, professing to be wise, but ye are a fool. The only thing I find impressive about your presentation is how anyone can be so consistently proven to be absolutely wrong about absolutely everything 100% of the time for such a long time and still believe yours is the absolute truth. It's not. None of it. You're wrong. There is no God. And the way I know this is because if there was, he would have slapped some sense into you by now.